All right, my people. Today, it's just me and you. I have some stuff just to catch up on. And quite honestly, I am working on going like gung ho with work in June and then trying to do a like very family focused July and August. So we have a bunch of recordings coming up in the next few weeks that'll kind of get us through the rest of the summer. But for this week's episode, we're just going to do a kind of catch all solo debrief. I wasn't going to do a video on this episode because honestly, I know I've said this before, I'm really just sick of looking at myself and I'm going to be honest with you all. I'm coming to this episode with a little bit of a depressive episode and I don't mean this episode's going to be depressive. I mean more so I'm in a bit of a depressive episode, just a funk, if you will, and I don't know why and that's the really annoying thing about depression is that I felt high on fucking life two days ago and like I could take on the world and then the past 24 to like 36 hours I feel very down and in the dumps and just like what am I doing questioning everything vulnerable those types of thoughts and it's really confusing to navigate if we're being honest if you experience it then you know what I'm saying it kind of comes out of nowhere there's no rhyme or reason I wish I had the antidote for it because then I could help everyone and myself, but I am trying my best to focus on my positive things and the things that fill me up and doing things that make me happy and all of that. But yeah, I'm just kind of in the dumps, but let's turn it around with this episode because I do love podcasting. All right. I want to recap my DC trip because Holy shit, was it the most empowering and impactful and activating experience. Like I keep using this word activating because Chloe and I, Chloe's the like creative brain behind my business. She came with me. She's been on the show before. And on the train ride home, we were just recapping how we felt and what we experienced and everything. And we kept turning to each other and just saying, I feel so activated. I feel like there's potential for actual change I feel like there's so much I want to do I feel like this is all I want to focus on even though it's not going to be it I do really want to focus on it and it was just this experience that I could have never imagined being in personally like in my past career but especially once I switched over to this lane and once I will say Over the past, I don't know, three-ish years, I have continued to say I want to be doing more charitable work. I want to be doing more work with organizations that are focused on a give back, whether it's with a company like a dream would be, say, I partner with a Nike and we go into schools and we talk about how sports can help with mental health and how mental health plays a role in athletics and just moving your body, that kind of stuff, like doing something that's hands on in a giving back manner. And I've been volunteering, again, I'm kind of side railing, sorry, but I've been volunteering, I don't know, once every like other week at a local food bank in our town and it was something that I've wanted to do since we moved here but I just wasn't making it a priority and I kept saying I don't have time I don't have time you know we make excuses and once we hired our nanny I knew that I would very quickly fill that new free time with something whether it be work or something social or myself you know you you fill what time you have or at least I do And I knew that then I'd get to a place where, again, I was saying, well, I don't have time. I don't know when I'd make it work. So once we hired our nanny, it was one of the first things that I committed to putting on my schedule every one to two to three weeks. And it has been one of the more impactful, but really just, I'm trying to think of the right word. It it fills my cup in a way I could have never imagined. It depends on the week what I'm actually doing, whether we're loading the groceries and like organizing it for the somewhat like farmer's market they set up for food insecure families or making the sandwiches to go out to our public local libraries and other places for insecure food insecure people. Um, But being in those moments, I've come to realize, yes, there's the act of helping people that feels amazing but I think there's also this huge benefit from community and I promise I'm going to tie this all back into DC but I have felt 
not lonely, but moving, you know, you're trying to find your people. It's confusing. It's like, what is your life look like? What do your friend's lives look like? Who do you connect with on certain things? And that feeling of belonging and community is so powerful. And I never would have thought I'd find this, especially as a non-religious person. This is technically in like a church area. It's in a church. So church setting, even though it's not a religious focus, it's honestly kind of surprising for me. Um, And the people who I'm connecting with are much older than me. The other day I was in a kitchen with like a bunch of 70 plus year old woman and again that's not a community I ever thought I would be feeling belonging to but just watching people connect over the shared belief of helping others have access to food and people who are like-minded in the sense of they're giving their time to do this and they want to help others it, it just has been such a beautiful experience and every time I come back from it I feel 110% and maybe that's the antidote to depression I don't know but it's absolutely something that I'm making a priority because I love doing it and I love the way I feel while I'm doing it and I love the fact that it's helping others and I love the people I've met and again it's that sense of community and belonging and I do think we lack that so much right now as a society being so online facing and I even think that way sometimes when you know people connect over hating someone I'm like they just want to feel like they belong somewhere like truly I think we all desire that so I've been doing that and it's been feeling remarkable and I'm really happy that I've made it a priority and alongside that I've been saying I want to do more actionable work with my job on causes that I care about. So to give some context, I was connected with Kitty from March 4th. She's the, I believe, founder, co-president is her title, but she's a fucking force. She's amazing. And we set up a call to talk about her coming on the podcast and to just learn more about March 4th. And I had known about them because I followed them and I've donated, but I didn't really know the backstory of hers. And I highly recommend anyone who cares about like gun violence prevention to follow them and to try to get involved. But basically their focus is on reinstating the federal ban on assault weapons. So they are a nonprofit nonpartisan organization. I think that's really important because they're not saying we are Democrats and, you know, we're taking away all of your guns. They are saying we are nonpartisan. We are not coming for the Second Amendment. We just solely believe that we should reinstate the federal ban on assault weapons because no one should need an AR-15. We are not at war. And They say reinstate because this ban did exist and it's been proven that it worked. Mass casualties were down 70% during the 10-year window from 1994 to 2004 that it was in existence from mass shootings. So we know it works and now we're just trying to get it back reinstated. And when I spoke with her, she was like, you know, we're doing a march on June 4th in DC. We'd love to have you. And I was like, done. On my calendar, I will be there. Done. How else can I get involved? She was like, well, if you want to come to D.C. the day before, we're actually going to meet with the White House Office for Gun Violence Prevention. And I said, done. I am there. Are you kidding me? Absolutely. And so we went up Monday. Never in a million years did I think I'd be going to the freaking White House and actually meeting with officials and being in these rooms. It was truly mind-boggling I felt like I was kind of living in this fever dream where I'm like what I'm doing this I'm walking down these halls I'm speaking with these people I'm in these conversations it was so inspiring it did leave me feeling very hopeful because I do think that there's a lot of positive change that's being made and has the potential to be made and I think that was very surprising for me because I think as a parent especially I feel disheartened by what's happening on many aspects of this country, but especially when it comes to gun violence. So it was an eye-opening experience. I was alongside a lot of people from the organization. 
a few other influencers and then some mothers of Covenant survivors from the Covenant school shooting in Tennessee. And what was so interesting about this experience and what the organization is doing is that alongside many people in the group, you know, many of them said, I'm a gun owner. I'm a right leaning gun owner. And I still want this federal ban on assault weapons. And I do think it's something that so many of us can agree on because again, we're really, we're trying to protect our children, obviously everyone, but like specifically our children. And it was amazing to meet these people, to feel like I was actually making a difference, to learn more about how to help the cause. You know, Tuesday, we then marched around the Capitol. Then we went in and we lobbied in Congress. Again, something I thought I would never be doing, ever. Really wild to me, two parts on that, that like one, we were marching around the Capitol. I'm like, the fact that January 6th happened is fucking insane. Being there and acknowledging that like at one point they were all like, we're going to storm the Capitol. And then they took it over crazy but the other part that like anyone can kind of go drop lit is what they call it or lobby in congress once you just get through security you can go see the offices of your senators or your representatives and that's kind of wild to me but it was really remarkable I really think that there is potential for change I want to say quickly if you were someone who wants to get involved because I've had a lot of people ask like how do I get involved how do we do more All of those questions, A, follow March 4th and stay up to date for more information. Um, B, Kitty is going to come on the show in the fall and she'll tell us more about March 4th and how to get involved and what you can do. But C, what you could do right now, it'll be in the show notes, is you can click on the link that will send you to a spreadsheet of your senator's numbers, your two senators for your state. It'll have their phone numbers and it has a little script. Obviously, you can ad lib, but that's like the general information is stating your name, your zip code, where you're a constituent of, and then saying that we are asking senators to co-sign the Go Safe Act. Again, on the show notes, it literally takes one minute. And if you're someone who really cares about this, feel free to text this to your friends. I send it to like my entire chat from my family members with my cousins my aunts all of that and I went through and I picked out all of their state stuff so I said like for instance Sally Lou here are your two representatives here are their numbers make it as easy as possible like the lowest lift but I truly like last night going to bed I was thinking like we have the opportunity to actually make a difference and to potentially see this change and it felt inspiring so that'll all be in the show notes it was something I never thought I'd be doing I was so proud and this is why like the depressive window episode that I'm in is even more so confusing and I texted Joe being like I'm just having a really rough day today I don't know why I'm in such a funk and he said I feel like you came home from DC and you were so inspired by your work and you were really lit up and excited and I was and that's why I'm almost more frustrated when I have these lows and I think so many people can hopefully or not hopefully but many people can relate if they experience this the going from the high to the low is more confusing for me and then adds on this layer of guilt like I shouldn't be feeling this way why am I feeling this way when I have xyz and I beat myself up so what I try to do is I'm just riding the wave I'm doing what I can to get through and I know on the other side there will be happier days and this might be done tomorrow it might be done in a week I'm not entirely sure the Greatest, I think, or one of the more surprising takeaways from the DC trip, and again, this is like the feeling of community and belonging and connecting, was conversing with these people who I would have never met in any other aspect of my life, most of them from Nashville, some from Chicago, who are just like-minded women, moms, who are fucking awesome and forces and who I connected with right off the bat. And I have a little bit of social anxiety lately. It's, I've been talking about it with my therapist. It's honestly surprising to me because I feel like I never had that. Um, But in these moments, yes, there were times where I was like questioning myself and like, what do I say? How do I say this? What, What did I just do? You know, the constant ping pong of thoughts that occurs in my brain. But meeting women who, after conversing with them, I look up to them, I admire them, I'm blown away by them. That is such a fulfilling experience to be in those types of rooms. Like I always want to be, not the dumbest, but I want to be surrounded by 
people who are smarter than me because I think that's the way that you grow and you gain knowledge and you learn new things and you expand. And that's exactly how I felt that day. And hearing their stories, especially the mothers of the covenant survivors was heart wrenching, but also a reminder of like, okay, this is why we're freaking doing this. This is why we're looking for change. So overall, it was an incredible experience. Please, if it's something you care about, even if it's something, even if you just have, you have children, if you, if you don't, it takes two seconds. It'll all be in the show notes. I did put up a question box for a few things for prompts for this episode. So one I want to talk about quickly is what are your strategies for taking both kids out of the house? So there are plenty of times where I am either alone with both kids or Joe is alone with both kids. For instance, when I'm in D.C. and he is parenting. Actually, sorry, I want to sidebar that question really quickly because I do want to touch on this. I mentioned on Instagram, but I know I talked about this in my sub stack, the idea of like having it all. And I don't believe that it's helpful to like spread the idea that you can have it all. If you find it helpful, then like good for you. For me, it leads to a constant feeling of I'm not doing enough. I'm failing somewhere. When am I ever going to feel like I'm succeeding? Those things. And I instead shifted my mindset to I can have it all, but not all at once. And there's the Shonda Rhimes graduation speech. I forget what school she's speaking at, but in it, she says, if you see me succeeding in one place in my life, just know that I'm failing in another part. I ad-libbed, but that's the general consensus. And I heard that and immediately it hit home. And I lived the exact experience while I was in D.C. because I felt like I was succeeding so deeply with work in that moment And I'm not saying I'm failing in other things, but in that same moment, that night prior, our toddler got sick, so he wasn't going to school the next day. Our nanny had an emergency dental procedure. Tuesday morning rolls around. It's chaos in the house because now no nanny and no school and Joe's working. Luckily, my mom had come to help him like overnight, but I immediately felt like this guilt. I'm not there to help. I'm not the one to take care of them. I'm not the one to fix this. And I was talking to my therapist about this and I said, why does everything, like, why does shit always hit the fan when I'm away? And she goes, well, shouldn't you be grateful? Look at it the other way. How nice it is that you're not home when shit hits the fan because it gets taken care of. Joe takes care of it. And it would suck to be the one that's like you don't want shit to hit the fan when Joe's away so isn't it kind of nice that it's hitting the fan while you're away and why feel guilty about that he it proves that like you can leave and even if shit hits the fan they maintain they like stride forward they get through it and it was such a interesting flip of that script for me because I don't know if the guilt will ever go away and I do think my husband would also have the guilt I don't want like I don't want to be putting more on other people's plates and when shit hits the fan that's what it equates to. However, it was interesting to look at it with that mindset to be like, yeah, and everything was fine. So they made it work. Like my mom left in the middle of the day, Joe made it work. He maybe he had to call a neighbor to come over to help for like a 20 minute window where he had an important call, but like he can figure it out. Similarly to the way that I know I would figure it out. But I think especially as moms, we put this like immense pressure on ourselves that it has to be us. And like we have to be the one to figure it out. And if it's not us, then it, we're asking too much of other people. And the, the other person in my example that is being asked of that, that is not making me feel any which way. It's me projecting my own shit. He's never saying anything that's making me feel guilty. It's my own inner dialogue. They can figure it out too. And they do. So I just wanted to sidebar that. But there are often times where one of us is solo with both boys and I have made it a priority, but also it's just a habit now. If I'm alone with the boys, we are getting out of the house because when we are in the house alone, like me and them, all I do is spiral. I think about the 10,000 things we have to do or want to do or... I look around the house and I'm like, shit, I have to do this. I have to do that. This has to get done. I want to do that. I also feel pulled to work because I'm at home. I have access to my computer. I know my office is upstairs. There's something about being in the home that makes my brain go berserk. 
with things that I want to do. So for me, getting out of the house is the best thing we can possibly do. Now, here's the caveat. Whether you have one kid or five kids, I believe this, there is always a toss up leaving the house. It can go so well. And the other morning I texted my family chat saying, God, it just feels so good when things go to how you hope they will. Like it was 8 a.m. I strapped on our baby in my carrier. I got our toddler on his bike. We walked up. We did a bike round around. We got to the park. He biked around the park. We biked home. There wasn't an argument. There wasn't a fuss. There wasn't a whine. There wasn't a complaint. There wasn't any type of negotiation. It was a plus. We get home. They're in a great mood. I'm like, that was such a success. And that's the one side. And then there's always the possibility that you're going to do this. You're going to get to the park, for example, and the toddler's going to throw a fucking fit. And they're going to say, I don't want to bike home. I want you to carry me. I'm not biking anywhere. La, 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 la. And then the baby's going to start crying. And it's in those moments where personally, I feel like I'm going to lose my mind. And you hit this moment of like, how are we going to get home? I have a crying baby attached to me. I have a toddler who's refusing to get back on his bike. I now have to carry the toddler and the bike. Like, we're now backing up against nap time for the baby. How are we going to make it back? And so whenever I leave the house, I have to accept that that is a potential of my future. And I don't say that to scare you. I say it so that when it happens, because it's not an if, inevitably if you leave the house enough with kids, it will happen. When it happens, I can just be like, and we lost this one. That's okay. You know what? That is okay. I never leave my house with expectations of anything going seamlessly because it's a rare occurrence that everything goes seamlessly. When it does, it feels fucking amazing. But that cannot be my expectation because I'm going to constantly be let down. And I don't want to be let down. So for me, getting out of the house is a lot about the mindset. It's about the mindset that let's go no matter what. My brain will be better out of the house than it is here. It may be a shit show, but it may also be awesome. Now let's roll the fucking dice. And logistically, I mean, it totally varies on how old your kids are, what you're doing, whether you're getting in the car, whether you're not getting in the car. But for us, it looks like, you know, I took them to the pool one afternoon. That's That's a definite hard on the spectrum of doing with two kids, but we did it. Um... We go on a lot of walks. We will go to the park. We will go grocery shopping. You know, grocery shopping is actually, I think, personally one of the easier ones. You get them in the car seat, then they're locked in the car. Then once we get to the grocery store, I wear our baby and I put our toddler in the grocery cart. He likes that. You know, like that's the logistical aspect of it. Walks, we're either doing the double stroller or I'm wearing the baby. Again, I just think getting out of the house is such a benefit for your mental health. It's really easy to feel trapped in your own home. It's easy to look around and think of the 10,000 things that you have to or want to get done. And honestly, I just think kids enjoy being out of the house more. Like as long as you have some option of food and water and like maybe a small toy that you know they like with them, nine out of 10 times, especially for my children, like they're behaving almost better outside of the house than they are at home. I just want to also say on that note, if your toddler throws a tantrum, like we have had a public tantrum, the worst one was at a swim class. And I think so much of navigating this is like navigating your own ego because immediately my brain goes to like oh my fucking god what do these people think of me like did these are these people judging us are these people thinking I'm an awful mom are these people thinking that like my kid doesn't know how to behave or whatever take yourself out of the equation of anyone else being in the room like your focus should be in my opinion just calming down your child and being there for them And I have seen so many tantrums in the wild and never once am I thinking like, God, that parent's awful. I'm thinking like, oh my God, I feel so badly for this parent. How can I potentially try to help? Like, what can I say? I go up to, I've been multiple times have gone up to parents after witnessing a tantrum and being like, I just want to tell you, you're amazing. Like you handled that so well. You're so inspiring. Like you're doing a great job. And most times I've met with like tears and hugs. Like I love complimenting parents in the wild. Because it's, I do not think, especially as moms, we get it enough. But removing yourself from the situation of thinking about everyone else is so helpful to just like 
get insular in the bubble of you and your child and try to like what's it called when you deregulate together like co-dysregulation or something where like you're doing deep breaths together you're working through it and then you just kind of accept that like yeah these people might be judging hopefully they're not these people might be watching whatever like it is what it fucking is you know what you're giving them a show we gave a full show the other day at swim class like a month ago it was a full performance for everyone involved this is a very interesting question what's your biggest flex and trigger point as a parent and a partner okay I think my biggest it's so interesting because the same thing is kind of the opposite for one I think my biggest flex as a parent is that a like I try I think my boys have so much fun I think we just have a lot of fun together as a family whether it's both Joe and I with them or myself alone with them or him with them like I just think I'm a fun parent but I also think I'm what I the thing I'm most proud of myself is my patience with my children. And my biggest trigger point as a partner is that I do not have patience. And I was thinking about this the other day where sometimes I feel like it's kind of like how you, people say, and I uh, agree with this, that the people you love the most sometimes get the worst versions of yourself or like, you know, you love your mom the most, but you're the meanest to her. And I almost feel like I not wear a mask, but I constantly am trying to be kind and be gentle and be caring and be patient. And I do have to work for those things. I'm embarrassed to say that, but I do. And I'm so not vigilant over it, but I'm aware of it that then sometimes with my husband, I like just completely remove the mask and the filter and I just like fucking let it all out and it's not always nice and it's something I'm working on and I don't have great patience with him and that's not fair but it's interesting I'll bring that to my therapist that my biggest flex in my opinion as a parent is my biggest trigger point as a partner um my biggest trigger point as a parent something that I want to work on is I feel like I'm not always present. My mind is constantly racing of other things that I should be or want to be doing and trying to navigate them all. And I also think that sometimes I try to like perfect quote unquote things instead of just giving everyone grace. So I think that's my biggest trigger point as a parent. And I think my biggest flex as a partner, I think I'm very understanding maybe. And supportive of like the want individual wants and needs and desires I don't know that's a very good question that I will ask him okay another question actually asks about something I've been talking about a lot in like this form of a TikTok and I think we did on Instagram I honestly I'm not even sure but what do you wish you knew as a first time mom and I have I think a whole episode dedicated to that I want to say I do, but I'm honestly not sure. And it's about the concept of like, just wait. We're told constantly when we're pregnant, like, oh, just wait, just wait, just wait until, oh, you're tired now? Just wait until you have a newborn. Oh, you're, you know, whatever. I fucking hate when people say it. I remember being pregnant and anytime someone uttered the words, just wait, I would just glare and literally want to do bad things. And It's such a shared universal experience. I was just at my best friend's apartment who is due like three days ago. And she's like, I'm so fucking sick of everyone texting me like, hey, baby there, baby there. Is there an update? Are you still pregnant? Blah, blah. And she's like, leave me the fuck alone. But it's also the fact that like, you know, if people weren't texting you, you'd be like, do they even care? It's just no one can do anything right, in my opinion, like when you are that pregnant. And I can comprehend that as a friend of someone who's pregnant, but also as someone who has been pregnant. But the just wait is so, I think, demeaning and fear mongering and also something that I hate, which is diminishing of your emotions and like the opposite of validating them. And what I wish I had known is like the just wait in the sense of how amazing it gets. 
just wait until your baby smiles for the first time. For me, there's that that moment of connection is so earth shattering. Or just wait until you sleep again. Like my God, your whole life will feel different. Just wait until your toddler says I love you or you have the conversations with your toddler that blow open your mind because you could have never imagined this little potato when they were a newborn speaking with you and conversing and making sense and asking you questions or just wait until they wrap their arms around you and give you an actual hug or tell you how their day, I'm going to start crying, tell you how their day was. Or the other morning, our toddler woke up and he was like, I was ice skating. And he just started telling me about his dream. And I'm like, oh my God, you have vivid dreams. And you're now at an age where you can remember them and recall them and tell me about them. How did we get here? Like just wait until you see how much fun it can be. Because again, I'm not someone who's great with the newborn. I'm not great in the postpartum period. But what I wish I had known the first time and why I think the second time was so much better mentally for me was because I had this knowledge of like, just wait until you see how fucking awesome and fun it can be. And if you already find it awesome and fun, I'm so happy for you. But if you don't, just wait until the moments that are in your future that will remind you of how incredible life is and this process and this human and your future is. So those are things I wish I had known as a first time mom. Another question, this is non-parenting. What are you thinking about summer house? So I tried the whole Vanderpump rules thing. Okay. I really did try. I tried, I tried, I tried. I couldn't get behind it. I don't know if it was because it was so old that like it just felt like I was watching this weird time warp period. The outfits were fucking hilarious, I will say, because that's how we all dressed. Um, but I just, it felt so toxic. I didn't feel like I liked any of the characters. And every time I'd watch it, I'd be like, I don't even want to watch this. And I am in a phase where all I'm doing or all I have time for is stuff that I love, such as cross-stitching. You guys, I'm addicted. I'm addicted. I'm addicted. I'm addicted. It's the best thing that's ever happened to me. We will get to that in a moment. But I stopped after like five episodes because I was like, we're done here. Everyone told me to watch Summer House. And I already feel like I was interested in Summer House because it's taken over my social media feed, I guess, because I'm a giggler and I follow some of them. And I know one from like growing up, like I just felt like I had context. So I started at season three because that's where people told me to start. And thus far, I am enjoying it way more than Vanderpump Rules. I think it's fascinating to watch knowing how certain things end up. Like I know about the whole Carl and Lindsay breakup. I know Hannah and Paige through Giggly Squad. I don't know them, but I I feel like I do because of the show. And so observing that, like right now what I'm watching, Paige and Carl are together. And in my head, I'm like, what the fuck is happening here? Like what? Um, But I'm very much enjoying it. Lots of side eye. Lots of side eye for Jordan. I'm just confused. Um, but I very much enjoy it. And what I have been doing is, well, nothing drastic, but I watch it at night. What I have been doing, though, is for me, and I mentioned cross-stitching, I could have never imagined cross-stitching being such a wonderful thing for me, like truly mind-blowing, because I need to keep my hands busy. Maybe the title of this episode is like things my ADHD brain does or something, but it's constantly tying back to my brain. Um, I need to keep my hands busy. And it's why I love reading because I have a physical book in my hand or Kindle, but like my hands are tied down to that. And so I only focus on one thing. But in the mornings, when I have my me time, I'll be drinking my water and my coffee and I'll kind of be sitting there and I'll want to be listening to my audiobook, but then I catch myself like opening my phone and then I'm opening emails and then I'm on Instagram and then I'm on TikTok and then I all of a sudden it's time to wake up the boys and I'm like, what the fuck did I even do with that time? I just spent it numbing my brain with my phone. And it's not how I want to start my day, but it's also not how I want to spend my time. And for me, cross stitching allows me to have my hands busy and focus on something where I never grab my phone. So in the mornings, I listen to my audiobook while I cross stitch. It allows me to actually focus on the audiobook and I enjoy just the act of cross stitching. But most importantly, my hands are busy. 
And same thing when I'm watching Summer House, I like to cross stitch because it's a good show, but it's not like keeping me captivated where I'm not going to grab my phone like the bear does or I'm trying to think of what the other show was that recently Joe and I watched like maybe last year and I was like, wow, that's the first show in a long time. I haven't like wanted to grab my phone because I don't want to miss a second, but that's so sad. But it's so true that even while consuming content, I want to grab my phone. Like I'm, I'm on the biggest screen and I'm like, oh, now I need my little screen. But having something to do during that time to just kind of keep that part of my brain quiet has been so beneficial. So for all of my people who relate to this, whose hands are constantly reaching for the phone or you're constantly trying to stim- like reach for simulation, even though you feel overstimulated, cross-stitching is where it's fucking at. Okay. I love it. Again, no idea what I'm doing with the designs that I do. I might like frame a few and put them in my office. I don't even care. I literally don't care. It's just been so beneficial for me. So that's what's been up this week. I threw a lot of random shit at you. I hope you enjoyed. I will say we have a lot of fun episodes coming your way. There are going to be a lot of probably guest episodes this summer maybe a few solo sprinkled in, but stay tuned. Follow along at Cameron Oaks Rogers at Conversations with Cam. Rate, subscribe, review, share all the things. You guys are the best and I love you.